Hi everybody, I'm Michael Davis. Welcome to Bone to Pick. We are coming to you today from our brand new headquarters here in New City, New York. And uh, I am really excited today and very honored to be sitting down with our featured artist for the month of June, uh, the great John Fedshock, a very old dear friend of mine, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to sit down with him today. Uh, John, from, as many of you probably already know, is an internationally renowned trombonist, uh, composer, arranger, band leader, uh, also producer, and a great educator. He spent seven years with the Woody Herman Orchestra, both as a featured trombone soloist and as the musical director. Uh, he is the leader of both the John Fedshock New York Big Band and the John Fedshock New York Sextet. He has released nine CDs as a solo artist. He is placed on the Downbeat Reader's Poll in three different categories, for trombone, for arranger, and also for big band. He uh, was nominated for a Grammy Award in 2003 for his arrangement of the Caribbean Fire Dance. Uh, he's active worldwide as a guest artist and clinician and as an uh, uh, artist for the EXO Brass Company. Uh, he's toured and recorded with uh, T.S. Monk, Jerry Mulligan, Louis Belson, Bob Belden, the Manhattan Jazz Orchestra, Carnegie Hall Jazz Band, just to name a few. And I want to add just a, before we get rolling with John, I want to add a personal connection for myself. Uh, I first met John back in 1979. Uh, I was a freshman at the Eastman School of Music, and John was a uh, first-year grad student in the program there. And he immediately became uh, kind of a mentor to me. He uh, uh, I was really drawn to his playing and his personality, and, and it was very important for me for that year that we spent together. I got so much out of John, and, and nothing's really changed over the years. Still uh, have so much uh, respect for him and uh, all the things he's accomplished. So, so John, welcome to Bone to Pick. Thanks, thanks for, Mike. Thanks Great for taking the time to get up to New City today. Yeah, That's sure. It's beautiful up here. But uh, let's jump right in and talk about your, your early formative years. I know you grew up in the Cleveland area. Maybe you could talk about that. And also, you know, what drew you to the trombone early on? Well, when I was nine years old, I was in like beginning band like everybody else. Uh, actually, they took all the kids into a room that had all the instruments out. And uh, I was just I was just drawn to the trombone. I I, I remember it just looking so strange that I, that's you know I wanted to. It, I was always a tall kid, so it's very possible that the director kind of pushed me in the direction of the trombone. So I, he's the only kid that could reach seventh position. But uh, I just remember looking kind of odd, and I was kind of an odd kid, and I thought that was a, a nice fit. Neither of my parents were musicians, uh, so there wasn't there was music in the house, but it wasn't anything you know particularly seriously focused in on one thing or another. Um, but when I got involved in band, I started getting more interested in just instrumental music and uh, you know, listening for the trombone on the radio, which it was more prevalent in those times. So it wasn't as much of a stretch for a young kid to choose to play trombone then, because you actually mm -hmm. saw it on television and you heard it sure. on the radio. So that's kind of how I started uh, playing. And my parents, uh, I asked them, I said, I want, a, I want a new horn. And they, they decided, okay, if we're going to buy this horn for you, you have, to, you have to practice every day, and we're going to get you lessons. And I said, great. I was really excited about it. And um, they picked uh, this music school, Modders Music, in, in, in uh, Mayfield, Ohio. And um, the teacher was a guy named Billy Lang, who was uh, like an old big band guy. He played with Ray Anthony and mm. was like one of the more... Uh, prominent uh, general business kind of players in, in Cleveland. And uh, so I, I, it, he wasn't necessarily a classical guy at all. And so he talked about you know nuts and bolts kind of stuff. And then we would always play duets at the end. And, and it wasn't like classical duets. It was like pop tunes and things like that. But it was, it was kind of cool because I got to sit next to someone who was phrasing things right. And then we'd switch parts. And uh, you know I, I think, and I had him all the way up through high school, except for a couple of years when my parents moved for about a year and a half. Uh, we lived in Florida. And at that time, I studied with two, two people, uh, a guy named Mo Lowe, who uh, was a, teaching at a, a music store down there, but once again, more of a, a jazz big band guy, and uh, Anthony Quintero, who was with the Orlando Symphony at the time. Mm. Um, just for a, 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 like a year and a half, and then we moved back to Cleveland. I went back to my studies with Billy Lang. So that's, that's kind of how those early years started. Um, it was just kind of like every other band kid, nothing special. And it really wasn't until maybe a year into that that I started getting my friends together. When we could actually play something on the instruments, uh, getting together and you know playing tunes and 
concerts for our parents and things like that. Uh, that's cool stuff. I think it must have been great in Cleveland. I mean, it's such a rich music history there. You know, so many great jazz players. Joe Lovano comes to mind, of course, right away. Yeah. But it uh, must have been nice in that level once you got to that point where you're... Unfortunately uh, for me, I never got to experience that because mm. I went right from high school. I never really played gigs in high school other than one. I had a little band in high school and uh, we did one gig at a VFW <laughs> hall. My dad got me the gig. Uh, it was at a VFW hall and it was a band. It was two trombones, trumpet, tenor, bass and drums. There was no keyboard history. No, it was just we uh. and we played, uh, you know, out of these fake books and we didn't really have the concept together about what playing a gig was. So uh, we went to this VFW hall. My dad got us this gig and was bragging to all his friends how we sounded great in our basement. <laughs> and we will play a tune. We play it like in the, you know, the little fake book had like a repeat sign. We play it twice through and we'd stop. You know, people would be on the dance floor. <laughs> Keep going. You know, so it was like, it was like a three hours of white knuckle, you know, <laughs> terror trying to get through this, this gig. But, uh, that was my only paying gig in, okay. in high school. Okay. It, was, it paid fifty-five dollars for the entire band. Mm. Wow! Which you know, I got the extra five dollars because I was leader. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's great. What a great story. Well, following high school, you uh, attended Ohio State University, which yeah. is an outstanding music program. Maybe you talk a little bit about your uh, your time in Columbus. Yeah. So uh, I never got to work in Cleveland, even having lived just you know outskirts. Um, but I went to Ohio State primarily to go to play in the marching band because oh, wow. my high school was a big marching band school and I was in the marching band. <laughs> so uh, I went to Ohio State and made the, the trek down there a few weeks before the school year started and uh, auditioned for the marching band and didn't get in. <laughs> and I had to go back to Ohio before school started with my tail between my legs telling all my friends who just thought I was going to just tear it up down there. <laughs> Uh, that I didn't get in a marching band. And then I proceeded to go back to the school and audition for all the ensembles, none of which I made. So that was, a, that was a, a kind of a harrowing experience for me. Uh, actually, I got, I got in like the third concert band and I was playing third trombone in like one of the lower jazz ensembles. So, but, uh, you know, didn't get in the orchestra or anything like that. So it was really kind of scary because my audition for Ohio State uh, they said you have to play an etude and you know some, some things like that and I went to my teacher at the time and I said what's an etude because <laughs> I had just been you know we're playing out of the Arbenz book and uh, playing duets you know so I had the technique and I had style for, for what I, for, but I had no idea what an etude was I had never played classical music ever so I played number one out of the Rochu book and uh, I guess I did well enough to get into a state school <laughs> um, <laughs> They, but by the end of my freshman year, uh, I took my first jury, which I didn't realize a jury was something you had to like get dressed up for and look nice for. I showed up in overalls and an old sweater <laughs> and uh, went in and played my jury. And I thought I did OK. And they asked me, you know, all these scales and thirds and fourths. And they had a specific scale sheet. And at the end, they said, how much time did you spend on the scale sheet? And I said, uh, well, actually, I didn't play the scale sheet at all. I'd, you know, I want to be a jazz musician, so I practice my scales all the time. And they didn't like that. <laughs> but fortunately, my teacher at the time, Joe Ducci, he was, it was his rookie year as a teacher. And he knew how much I wanted to, uh, to be a musician. So he stuck up for me because they were going to drop me from the music program. Oh, wow. And so that's, uh, that's the point when I really had the wake-up call and started practicing five, six hours a day throughout the course of my time at wow. Ohio State. Yeah. That's incredible. I didn't know. Uh... No, you said it so long. I didn't know that part of the this, this story. So, good lesson there for you, young trombonists out there. If you don't make the marching band, don't despair. <laughs> you might become one of the great trombone players of all time. Um, well, let's let's keep going on the education front. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know I had the great fortune of meeting you early on at Eastman. But maybe, I know you were there for a year, and then we'll talk about uh, Woody's band after after this. But maybe you could talk about what that was like going from Ohio State to Eastman. Sure. Well, I mean, to, to kind of tie it all in, actually, when I was a junior in high school, Woody Herman's band came and did a concert and clinic at my high school. Mm. And Jim Pugh was playing in the trombone section, and Dale Kirkland and uh, and uh, Art Linsner, who's now in in Chicago. It was a great band, 1974. And um, it was very inspiring. I sat in the front row and it was 
because I had been listening to big band music. I had an uncle that gave me a Tommy Dorsey record, and he said, if you play trombone, you should know who Tommy Dorsey is. So I was listening to it and really digging it, but I thought big bands were like, you know, museum piece. Right. And here is this band comes in, it's all these guys in their 20s playing Chick Corea and pop tunes and fusion music, and all of a sudden there's this whole different energy, and they're playing the old music too, but it made me think, wow, this is something that's still alive and, and breathing, and something I could maybe take part in somewhere down the line. So that inspired me actually to, to get into jazz more than anything, more than listening to my first J.J. Johnson or my first uh, Charlie Parker records. <clears throat> was hearing Woody's band play three feet from my face mm. and Jim Pugh and all the other, you know, all these trombone players coming up and soloing. And so I said, well, wow, how's this happened, you know? And, and then I found out that Woody was getting all his trombone players from Eastman. So I thought, okay, well, the, if I have any hopes of getting here, I've got to get good enough to at least get into Eastman. And so that was kind of the short-term goal I had set for myself during my time at Ohio State. Uh, I started as a music education major at Ohio State, but our second year, my second year in school, they started a jazz degree. So um, I was a little fearful of not doing music yet in case I didn't get good enough to become a professional player. So I, uh, I just added the, the jazz degree courses, so I got two degrees, uh, which took me a lot more time, but I, every summer I would take math and English and science and that stuff so that during the school year I could take all the music classes. Mm -hmm. And um, had to, I actually ended my double degree at the end of the summer, like three weeks before Eastman started. So I went like five years, mm. continuous school. So I was, when I got called to go on Woody's Band, I was ready <laughs> to go. ready to go. <laughs> um, but so uh, when I was at Ohio State, we, we did a lot of touring with the band. The band was very good at the time. And uh, we played a lot of festivals and a lot of uh, conferences. And one of them was the, um, at that time, the NAJE, which became right. IAJE, which big jazz conference. And uh, I noticed that Eastman's band was playing there too. So I wrote a letter to Ray Wright, who was the director of the big band, as you know, um, and said I was gonna be there. I was interested in coming to the school. And we were playing at this time, and you know, it'd be great to talk to you sometime, and we would really love to come to the school. And Ray came to the concert and sat there and listened to the whole concert. And after we were done, he came up and talked to me and we sat down, the, the place had cleared out. We sat down for like a half hour and he, I, he answered questions I had about Eastman. Really, really nice. And that really won me over for, for him. And uh, so uh, another, another story, I auditioned uh, in Cleveland for Eastman, a live audition. And uh, I think, uh, what was the guy's name? John Engberg, was that his name? Oh yeah, right. Yeah, 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 he, was, yeah. he was doing the regional audition. And I, it, was a, it was a huge blizzard, and my dad picked me up in Columbus, and we drove two, actually almost three hours, to get to the auditions that were at Cleveland State. And I played my audition, and at the end I played a little jazz solo, you know, which I don't know how well that went over. <laughs> um, but I was, I was denied uh, for the regional audition, so I told Ray, I said, you know, I, I made an audition, and uh, they, they said I wasn't accepted, and Ray said, well, let me see what I can do. If you wouldn't mind, if you, could you prepare a recorded audition and, and send it to John Marcellus, who's teaching at the school, and, uh, and we'll see how, how, how things go. And I did, and, and I got accepted, thank, thankfully. Um, and so that's kind of how I got into the school. Mm, that's yeah. great. I got to say, I had a very similar experience. Uh, growing up in California, my dad would always take us uh, to hear every big band, you know, when they would come around, Woody's band, Buddy's band, Maynard's band, Basie band. And I remember exactly the same, same kind of feeling, like hearing uh, Jim Pugh and the, and the guys in the band, and, I, and then I bought one of the records that they would sell, the LPs that they would yeah, sell at the gig, yeah. and then on the back it said, like, you know, it was some little coined the phrase, you know, the finishing school, the Eastman School of Music finishing school <laughs> for trombone or whatever the, the phrase was. Right. But, um, yeah, it certainly had such an impact, the, the combination of those guys and then, and then Woody's band, and uh, it was very cool. Well, I do remember us being, you know, 30-plus years ago now, I remember us being at Eastman and thinking about getting, dreaming about getting on Woody's band. It's and 35 and years 35, ago. thank 35 you for that update. Uh, and, Going uh, <laughs> on 36, yeah. <laughs> like I said, it's been a while, but... Uh, it, um, but I remember us talking about it and dreaming about it, and, and uh, you certainly fulfilled that dream at the highest level. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll interject as we go, because we, as we said earlier, you could do the whole interview just on, on the experience you had with Woody. But maybe you could talk about, you know, I just I remember you leaving school and going on the band. Every, we were all so excited for you. 
Um, but maybe you could talk about, obviously, it meant a lot to you in your career and all the, ex you know, whatever experiences stand out oh, for you sure, with Woody. Oh, sure, sure. I mean, first of all, I couldn't have got on Woody's band without, you know, that one year, to be mm -hmm. honest. Playing with high caliber players at, at Eastman and studying, not only studying writing with Ray, which ended up, you know, my first charts for Woody were for, for Woody, my first mm -hmm. charts were for Woody Herman. I never mm -hmm. had a laboratory to like try stuff. It was, you know, but also studying with John Marcellus, I thought was, uh, you know, that really uh, helped me turn the corner on so many things, stuff that I'm still working on, uh, technically speaking, but, but stuff that uh, kind of helped me to be able to turn a corner as far as what I could do uh, technically on the mm -hmm. instrument. Um, so, but when I did get on Woody's band, I got, uh, I, I think I went, Kim Scharnberg and I went to go hear Woody's band in Buffalo when we were mm -hmm. at Eastman together. Um, and I just, all through college, I don't know why, but I was just doing this just because I had no confidence. Anytime I played something good, I'd get a copy of the recording. Just, all right, if I don't think I can play, I'll listen to this and remind myself that I, I sound pretty good. So I kept updating, and I had a you know 90-minute tape of all my favorite stuff that I had played. And I did the same thing at Eastman. And so when we went to go hear Woody's band, I gave a tape to Gene Smith, who was playing lead trombone on the band at the time. I said, right. if you ever have an opening, I would love to come and play. And a few months later, you know, this was uh, you know, after just one year of grad school, um, he called me up. And uh, actually, he called me up. It was, it was in uh, July. And I uh, called up in the middle of the night, basically, four in the morning, because the band was in Los Angeles. And uh, I was, happened to be at my parents' house because it was in, su in the summertime. And, uh, you know, my parents were up and, uh, you know, I accepted the gig and I told my parents and I was just like racing, you know. Yeah. And I remember my dad said, that was the first time I ever had a, a glass of scotch with my father. You know, he <laughs> said, well, you got you to calm down. How about let's celebrate with a little scotch, you know. So, That's great. So, but, uh, you know, when I joined the band, it was, it was uh, you know, something, you know, a lot of the music I had already memorized, you know, all the little trombone solis and stuff I had already had memorized. Mm -hmm. So I could stand up and not worry about it so much. Um, uh, but the first night, Woody was, uh, you know, his usual crotchety self. A lot of times he'd be a very warm person, but he could also be a very grouchy guy. And uh, the guy I was replacing was Nelson Hines, who was also an Eastman grad. And um, Nelson played a lot of, on, that, on the band, he was particularly playing a lot of stuff with the plunger and a lot of like really funky, bluesy kind of stuff. That was all in his book. And um, so I went to play and I did my usual kind of bebop thing on something. And what he said, it's got to be funkier. <laughs> you know, if it's not funky, funkier tomorrow, we'll have to do something about it. You know. So, okay. All right. Here we go. But uh, you know, once again, kind of like when I was told I couldn't be a music major at Ohio State. You know, the, someone tells me I can't do something is when you want to do it sure. the most. So yeah. the next, the next night, I uh, no fear in me at all. I just went out there and played. You know, every blues lick I could think of. You know, just kind of. You know, really choked up on the mic, made it real kind of nasty, and then and then that was that was the night where he he started calling me Too Tall John, <laughs> and then someone said, "Well, if he makes up a nickname for you, that means that's you're a on good the sign. band." Yeah. yeah so, so that's kind of when that started, um, and I, you know, he, it was a great great time just touring the world, um, you know, playing with the, all that great music. God, I mean, I learned so much about writing just from playing all that great music. And especially after a while, you, you know, the book was this thick, but I eventually had it all memorized, and I could, uh, you know, just if something interesting happened in the band, I could actually kind of be aware, more aware of what's going on mm -hmm. around me, and it really helped inform how I was going to write charts for him eventually, because mm -hmm. I waited like almost three years before I wrote anything for him. Mm. That's a good, that's actually a really good piece of advice, I think, you know, because I... There's been, uh, historically, so many trombone players have been great arrangers, but a lot of that might come... Part of it's because we're in the middle of the band, but another part of it is, like what you just said, if, if you memorize something and you can take your head out of the part and see and be aware of what else is going on musically, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. a very, uh, very helpful place to be. So how many um, albums did you guys, albums in those days, did you guys yeah. do with uh, Woody uh, I, I think time? I think at the time, I four or five, maybe, over the course of time. Couple, one of them was a bootleg, I think, but I think five albums we did with the band. Uh, two of which I wrote. Mm. So I didn't start writing. I joined the band in, on July 6, 1980, and I didn't write a chart for the band until uh, 
1982, like the early part of 82, mm. when we were in that club in New Orleans for s six months. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, I figured I had a chance. I could bring in little pieces, and after the gig, I'd tell the guys to stick around, let them kind of hear the sax soli or whatever. Um, and so that's kind of when I started getting involved in writing, because at the time, John Otto was with the band, writing great charts for a couple of years. Sure. Um, but so I wrote a couple of charts that Woody seemed to like, and we were playing them, and then when John left the band, I was kind of like, the guy, the only guy left that was writing anything. So I, he started giving me assignments, and I was kind of like trial by fire, mm. you know, having to write stuff. That's very cool. Yeah. And uh, was the 50th anniversary record was, was were you still on the band, or did they bring yeah, you was, back for no, that? Yeah, I was saying? still on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was maybe you talk was, a little bit about that was a pretty uh, seminal yeah, uh, recording um, for Woody's band. Yeah, because yeah. Woody had been in the band in, in show business with his band since 1936. So mm. in 1986, we in 1976 they they celebrated his 40th anniversary, uh, and they did an album with Jim Pugh and that particular band. Mm. And then 1986 we did an album, and once again it was a live album. But um, the, the kind of cool thing about that record was, I mean, Woody had gone through all these phases, dealing with fusion music and playing a lot of pop music and rock and all that stuff. And I, I like all that stuff, but my sensibility was more towards straight ahead jazz. So I was writing more charts like that. So that, that album ended up being mostly straight ahead jazz. And what I really liked about it was, uh, not, I mean, obviously it got Grammy nominated and was very successful, but the, the one thing I liked about it was that a lot of the reviewers were saying they liked that Woody kind of came full circle. You mm -hmm. know, it was the mm -hmm. end of his life. He kind of came full circle and, and went back to, you know, his roots and was playing great straight ahead jazz again. And I, I kind of felt, you know, like that was partially due to just me kind of forcing it in there a little bit. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Very cool. Maybe we could talk a little bit now about your... The, maybe ending your time on the band and then making the decision to move to New York, which has typically been the kind of the pipeline. Well, New York or Los Angeles pretty much, uh, yeah. other places as well, but, but those are the, the two big centers. But what, was, uh, what are your memories of looking back on making that? I know it's always tough for everybody to yeah, make the I jump, mean, but... Part, part of me wishes that um, I would have made the move sooner because as we know now in retrospect, the whole scene in New York you know, the recording scene and all that stuff dropped off. I got a little taste of it, but I would have liked to have had more of a taste of it. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, timing-wise regarding my personal growth, it was just right. I mean, uh, when I joined the band, I was playing the second chair and, uh, you know, just really focusing in on, on soloing and improvisation and listening and getting my act together, technically speaking. Uh, and then... You know, then when I moved up to the lead chair, as you know, you joined me playing the second chair. Mm -hmm, and sure. Uh, matter of fact, I, I, I enjoy telling the story because uh, when I moved up to the lead chair, I wanted to get, Woody was so accustomed to my sound in the second chair, I wanted to get someone, and as Mike mentioned, he was kind of, as, as a youngster, <laughs> was kind of, you know, emulating my sound a little bit. So I thought, okay, well, this will be a familiar kind of a thing. So, you know, I thought that would work well. Anyway, well, so... I appreciate I moved, that. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, then I moved up to the lead chair and uh, a whole other set of problems and issues and things I had to focus in on. So, you know, every few years there'd be something else that would musically be a reason to stay mm -hmm. and not necessarily just for money or I want to go see Europe mm -hmm. or I want to record an album. It was more like there's stuff I got to get done and here's, here's a perfect opportunity to work on it. And so I moved up to the lead chair and then I started writing the charts and then, um, you know, that became a whole other thing, how I'm, how I'm going to kind of have my writing evolve into some kind of personal style. And uh, then when we did start recording, it became you know, getting involved in the production process and, uh, you know, working on rehearsing the band and all those types of things that, you know, aren't things I was necessarily thinking about when I was in college. Mm -hmm. But they all, every time something like that, you know, I think about leaving the band. And of course, through that seven years, a lot of the guys, yourself included, moved to New York. And so, uh, you know, I think, okay, I know all these guys here, they're all doing great. Um, maybe it's the time, and then something else would come up. Wow, you know, that would be good for me to stick around and just bang at that for a while and, mm -hmm. and, and get better at that. And, uh, but the fortunate thing was, leaving that much time in between, you know, being on the road, all these people that had passed through the band that had moved to New York, I had, I had a, you know, a network of people in the city that I could uh, at least... Obviously, you're not going to get work from everybody, but at least emotional support and, you know, sure. uh, 
it was a, a big help. A lot of people helped, you know, recommend me for things and uh, kind of get me past. In addition, to, in addition to having really kind of an audio business card, I could give someone a CD and say, "Here's my writing, my my production skills, my lead from boom playing, my soloing, you know, blah blah blah." Mm -hmm. I also had people that would, you know, vouch for me, and I, it kind of kept me from having to go through those first two or three real painful steps when you first move to a city and nobody knows who you are. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it worked really well for me, um, establishing that I could do a lot of different things, and that kind of led to what it is I do now overall. Mm -hmm. That's another great piece of advice, and I think uh, that's generous of you to mention that, John. You know, for young people out there especially, like we're presented with musical situations that a lot of times... You know, I think that's a lot of, not a lot of your success, but a part of your success is how you're able to kind of like frame the things and, and get the positive thing out of it. Like you're saying, you know, if these different musical situations would come up with Woody and yeah, that's that I can work on this skill set going forward and I'm not, may not get that opportunity again. So yeah, yeah. really good, uh, really good piece of advice for all of us is like when, when you're in a musical situation that might not be exactly what you're looking for, there might be something in there that, that, uh, can help you develop a skill set that's going to pay dividends down the road. And which leads kind of perfectly into talking about your own big band, which has become a highly successful band. Um, one of the top bands in New York City and the best players. I mean, it's really a joy to hear the band both recorded and, and live. Maybe you could talk about, um, you know, how you formed the band. And, 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 and I also, you know, maybe it's kind of a three tiered question, but I'd love for you to talk about um, you know, your, the, the publishing side of it, which all you, you've have published so many uh, charts is incredible. And also, and we'll get into the production side a little bit more, but just how you deal with the logistics of booking your band, getting the players, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very involved process yeah, for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the personnel was first put together in uh, 1989, um, and which is a long time ago, and I have most of the same guys, which, mm -hmm. which is a testament to, I guess, they, they like what I do, or at least, at least it doesn't hurt them too badly. <laughs> I uh, think it's the former, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, you know that, that's a, a big thing, is I always try and consider the, the individuals. I, being a side band for as long as I, I've been, and playing with, with a lot of different big bands and a lot of different groups with leaders that are less than uh, sensitive to the side <laughs> man. Um, that's really the first and foremost thing, is not to, get, not to have the side man be uncomfortable, because that's, that's going to give you bad results, or at least bad press mm -hmm. amongst the rest of the music community. So I try to take care of all, all the guys. Um, and really, a lot of it, over half the guys in the band were guys that had passed through Woody's band during my time, because I knew that they knew the way I wrote music, uh, were kind of sensitive to my style, and, and I, could, I had experience listening to them play my music to know if they would fit or not. And the rest of the guys were people that I had met. I moved to New York in 1987. Uh, I spent about two years, you know, playing with different people and just kind of decided, oh, that guy would be great for this chair. If I ever do this, this is this kind of be the group. And then some, a couple guys were recommended to me. Um, and within the first couple of rehearsals, you just knew that they were natural, natural fits. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason I started the big band Number one, I always loved the big bands, but I mean, when I was on the road, I used to think, wow, you know, some of my favorite writers for the band, where did they go? Where did they go? And it was, I haven't heard their name in like 10 years. And, you know, it's that, well, well they're, they're writing for a, a, you know, soap opera or, mm -hmm. you know, a, a sports TV or something. And it's like, really? God, God, they wrote such great stuff. Why are they, why aren't they doing that anymore? And then I realized, of course, it's, it's not financially viable at all. <laughs> But I thought if I had the opportunity to do it, I, I would want to, you know, I've spent all this time developing this craft. I, I didn't want to just like toss it aside to sell dog food, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought, well, what, what better way when I moved to town to showcase what it is that I do? You know, I could, I could show that I write, that I can, I'm a good contractor. Um, I, I can organize these things, uh, promotion, all, you know, all that stuff. In, in addition to my writing and my playing. And mm -hmm. I think in general that really helped me uh, early on to get a lot of work in different types of things in New York and not just go to New York and say I'm a trombone player and I'm just gonna play jazz. You know, it just limits limits yourself. So, and that's the reason why I was on Woody's band. I was still always, every, you know, I would always practice etudes and, and you know, carry my Rochu book, which was like a crumpled mess by the end. <laughs> 
Uh, I'd get up two hours before the bus left every morning and practice, you know, and Byron Stripley never believed me <laughs> until one morning the bus was leaving early and he knocked on my door and I was holding my horn and I had the music set up. He goes, wow, you really do do that. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it, uh, the big band really has been a, a wonderful experience for me, you know, made some lifelong friends. Uh, guys have been playing with me for almost 25 years now. Uh, really amazing. Um, and that, in a lo that alone has helped the band to evolve in its sound. I mean, obviously my writing is changing over the years, but knowing the players more intimately, what their preferences are and what, what kind of harmonic sense they have and how better to complement what they do, it makes it more of a, a unique package than just you know, write some charts, hire a bunch of guys to play them kind of right, thing. Right, yeah. right. Well, it's a great band, and for those of you... Uh who aren't familiar with it, maybe we could talk a little bit about the new CD that's coming out in, in August, I August. think you said, right? Yeah, the release talking? date is August 7th, I believe. Um, the album's called Like It Is, and it's going to be on the Mama uh, Records label, which is based in uh, California. And uh, we, it's kind of a mix of originals and, and arrangements, kind of like uh, my past albums, half and half, I guess. Uh, but all my arrangements and uh, half original tunes featuring the guys, I mean, I'd say half the tunes don't, I don't, I don't solo on. Mm. I mean, that's something on all my records that I've always kind of tried to spread the wealth. And, you know, I like to play, but I don't want it to be necessarily be a trombone album. I want it to be more of a collective type of thing. Mm. Nice. Mm. I think that's a great thing. Um, very generous from your standpoint as a leader uh, to allow everybody the opportunity to play. And, and, and it's hard to do on a gig when you've got 16 guys that are all great players to organize it in such a way that over two sets, everybody gets to play a couple times. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a big challenge, but and it, it drives me crazy and it drives my wife crazy. <laughs> but um, but I'm constantly thinking about that. You know, you might have the right combination of stuff, and oh no, those two tunes are in the same key. Nobody really cares, but I care. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I painstaking moments in, in organizing the set list, but it, it ends up paying off. And you mentioned your wife, which we should uh, definitely mention that in a more formal way. She's a great bass trombone player, Jen Wharton, and. Uh, very successful here in New York, and you'll hear her on the new CD. I'm, uh, I'm quite sure. You won't. You won't. Oh, she's no, not on. Okay. No, no. Okay. She has a, a firm policy to, you know, if there's, especially I've been using George Flynn on bass trombone oh, since course. 1989. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but even if George can't make a rehearsal, she she makes she said, call anyone else you would call to sub before you call me. If they can't do it, oh, okay. I'll do it. Wow. I don't want anybody to think I'm there because I'm your wife. <laughs> And that's, you know, to her testament. And obviously, she's a fantastic player. And, can, you know, you know, it's, it's not, not an issue at all. She plays really great. She certainly does. Yeah. No, no question. Yeah. I guess I thought maybe she's on it because uh, you're in, in, in addition to all the things that you do in town, you, uh, the jazz cruise, you're the big band director. And I know yes. the, last, the last cruise, I believe she uh, played in the band with Yeah, uh, she's with played you guys, the, so. the past few. Actually, the very first year I was uh, hired as a side man, uh, 19, uh, 2009, 2009. Uh, Ken Peplowski was doing it. And it was the mm. first year they did a big band made up of all-stars. Uh, normally, they just hired a big band, you know, uh, the Clayton Hamilton band or the Basie band or something. And then they'd have a bunch of uh, guys playing small groups all over the ship. But then eventually they said, well, you know, we got all these guys. Let's try our hand at forming a band. And so uh, Ken called me up, and they, they needed another trombone player. And, you know, he, probably in the back of his mind, he also thought he's a writer. Mm. So he said, bring a bunch of charts. And uh, we ended up playing most of my charts. And the following year, he said, you know what? This is getting to be a little bit too much for me. I'd rather just play more. Can you split the duties with me? And so the next year I did. And actually, that very first year, um, it was myself and Wycliffe Gordon and John Allred. And it was supposed to be Andy Martin. And Andy got uh, some kind of movie date or something and couldn't mm -hmm. make it. And Ken said, uh, do you have any recommendations? for who, sh who we should hire on trombone. And I said, well, I'm sure, you know, uh, John or Wycliffe, they probably could play bass trombone, but most charts require bass trombone. So mm -hmm. you know the guys in New York to call uh, for bass, but in case you can't get anybody, just want to let you know that my plus one, <laughs> my wife, is a great bass trombone player, and she's going to be on the ship. And Ken said, Oh, let's just do that. <laughs> it's like easy, you know. I, you, know you know, I assured him that she's a fantastic player. So she came out, and we were both side men, side women, men, whatever. Uh, and she tore it up. She did yeah. so great. Then after the cruise was over, Ken went up to her. Actually, he went up to her first 
said, can you come back next year? Uh, and then he asked me to come back, and he, we split the duties the following year. And then, then the year after that, he said, just take it. You know? oh, nice. So I've been, I've been uh, directing the band since, by, myself since 2012. And it's a real challenge because it's you know, all these great players, and you want to showcase them in the right light with minimal amount of music because we're playing behind uh, acts as well, like singers like Kurt Elling or mm. John Pizzarelli. We're doing their show. Sometimes there's solos within the show, but in general, we have like a 20-minute time to feature the band before the, the act comes out. So it's a real challenge, but it's, it's been a great fun thing every year to do because uh, not only does it give me a chance to, to stand in front of a great big band, but just kind of hone those skills, you know, dealing with, I mean, none of the guys are prima donnas, but, but once again, being sensitive to the side man, knowing how great these guys play, I'm not gonna let 20 minutes go by where Randy Brecker doesn't play a solo. That's just, that's <laughs> heresy. <laughs> Well, it must. It's, uh, it's and plus, it's got to be tough to pull yourself out of New York in the middle of January to yeah, get on a Caribbean cruise. Strangely <laughs> enough, New York wants us to stay here, though, because the past few years has been a torrential snowstorm on the day we're supposed to travel to Florida. So it's always tenuous getting down there. But once we're down there, it's like okay, we're away. <laughs> That's great. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, your work as a guest soloist and a clinician. You're, you're active. I mean, I went to your website in, in preparation for this uh, interview, and it's just, you know, list, uh, you know, tons of stuff, and as you've done for years. And obviously a byproduct of, of the work you've done as a big band leader and the sure. work you did with Woody. But uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and, and how, you, how, how you look at that kind of work. Uh, yeah, that, that, that first started uh, actually shortly after I left Woody's band, and, and that all the stuff I wrote for his band at the time on those albums, much of it was published. So you had a lot of university bands playing the charts, and professional bands too, for that matter. And uh, it was at that time when I, when I was a kid, and you, I remember, you know, we talked about it when we were in school. When, when I was a kid, you know, people were going around doing clinics. Irby Green was doing clinics, Bill Watchers was doing clinics. It was kind of a, a unique thing to have someone who was so accomplished, you know, Clark Terry came to Eastman and talked to the yeah, students. Yeah, of course, you know. that was amazing. Yeah, and, and it's like, okay, that could be something really cool to do. And the fact, and I got a couple bites, you know, like uh, there was a school in Chicago that said, we'd like to have you come and we'll do a tribute to Woody Herman. We want to do some of your music and have you solo with the band. Okay, great. So it, it was all kind of, once again, based upon that I could do a lot of different things. You know, mm -hmm. someone who just wrote, less of a chance to get those types of things. Or someone who just plays, well, then we got to get music for them. So mm -hmm. this was kind of like a all one package deal. Um, and so when I got that first big clinic in Chicago, I decided, okay, this is a chance to try to do something. And at the time, I was trying to make ties with, uh, at the time, I was playing King Trombones, and I wanted to get hooked in with an instrument company because all the great, you know, all those ads you used to see in Downbeat, so-and-so plays this trombone. And so I was talking to them and they said, and they said well, we very pleased you're playing our horn with Woody Herman and all that, uh, but, you know, just keep us updated. So, so I decided when I did this gig in Chicago, I just called, cold called all these schools in Illinois and Iowa and Indiana and I put together like a week and a half long tour, just hitting all these high schools and staying in sleazy hotels and, <laughs> you know, making no money at all, but sending programs to the instrument company. And, uh, you know, that got me involved with, with being an, an endorser of instruments, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, always helps out. You know, sometimes they can help with expenses or hotel rooms or a flight or whatever. Uh, and that's kind of how it all started, just mm. kind of doing it myself and uh, for very little money just because I thought it would be kind of a cool thing to do where I could do everything that I do all in one place. Yeah, oh, that's great. Very, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I've always been a, an admirer, but one of the things that, you know, we get from this interview is that you're, you're very proactive. I mean, you're like, you know, what's, what's the I next step? I play trombone. You, know? <laughs> you kind of have to be. <laughs> it does kind of go hand in hand. You're, you're right. Out, yeah. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned being a, uh, um, an endorser and a, an artist for an instrument company, and uh, I know you're now uh, uh, an EXO brass artist. Yeah. And uh, helped design this uh, wonderful instrument here, the uh, EXO 1632 trombone. Maybe you could, I know it's coming out soon as well. Is yeah, the, the, I, I was that. able to play the first production models last week, and uh, the horns should be in stores in August. But I'm really excited about it because... You know, I played a lot of instruments, and I was actually involved in the design for a couple other companies designing instruments, and I kind of took the good and 
you know, to, to kind of decipher the good and the bad of everything and uh, put it into this. And uh, XO Bass was really, really super patient with me. It was mm -hmm. over a two year process. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it was, you know, they had to wait two or three months to get something modified very, in a very small way because they didn't have the tooling yet. You know, we had to come up with the design first, then they had to design the tooling and the machinery to do all that stuff. So it was very time consuming, but they were very, very patient with me. And, uh, you know, it's kind of the best of everything. And it's like, my, my whole thing was I wanted something really, really lightweight mm -hmm. because if I'm, uh, you know, playing in a club for four hours, playing long solos, you know, you, you don't want something that's going to cramp your hand up or whatever. And I wanted something really fast, fast slide. So this is like extra lightweight. So it's, it's a lot lighter weight than something normally uh, this size. It's like 2.3 pounds without the counterweight. Wow. Um, the counterweight is still under three pounds with the counterweight. So, uh, and ergonomically, it just feels really good in my hand. And it's, it's real, uh, it's very thin gold brass. So it's, uh, it just you can feel it vibrate in your hand, so it's really cool. It's all the, all the good things that I've always wanted in a horn. And it's kind of they were patient enough to have me get to where I wanted it to be. Wow, that's exciting. Well, that's yeah. cool. We'll look forward to seeing that. So that's yeah. a, just a refresh. XO 1632. 1632, 500 bore. Very cool. Uh, ultra lightweight, they call it. Okay, very cool. Um, John, I wanted to talk about uh, your yet another facet of your uh, the many hats you wear, and, that, and that's your role as a producer. And um, I, I knew that you had done a lot, obviously, with your own uh, records, but your production credits include uh, Tony Cadlick, Pete McGinnis, uh, Kim Pencil, Mike Holliber, George Rabbi, Charlie Pillow. Well, I guess i got to call him Charles now. Charles. I, I refuse to. He prefers to. I, Charles. I, I, I know he prefers that, but I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> one of the great, one of the great uh, woodwind soloists anywhere in the world, Charles Pillow. But, um, but I had firsthand experience getting the opportunity to play on Tony Cadlick's uh, great Around the Horn CD that you produced, and mm -hmm. I was... It wasn't surprising. I knew it was going to, you were going to be great, but you uh, you were just exemplary as a as a producer and keeping Thanks. the session moving. Obviously, completely comprehensive uh, overview of the music, but also just keeping the vibe really good. You just had a very great nature about you, and uh, and I know I talked to Tony afterwards, and he just was saying echoing the same thing. I think everybody felt. But great. maybe you could talk about you know when you wear that hat, what's that like as far as you know just approaching it as a producer and not. Sure. Well, I got involved in that early on, actually, when I was at Ohio State. Uh, unfortunately, they don't offer this class anymore, but they had a, a class where they, half the students in the, in the class were jazz musicians and half were recording engineers. And it was an electrical engineering class about recording. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was basically about how to speak to each other. You know? And, you know, engineers don't know anything about musical terms. Musicians don't know anything about you know, engineering terms. And uh, the final was mixing a big band chart um, at the big board, hmm. you know. And I, I did pretty well, and the, the instructor, you know, encouraged me to kind of continue on that. And one of my buddies worked at a, at a studio. So we would go in there and record stuff and, uh, you know, just little silly quartet, quintet, whatever things. And it, that got me really interested, and it kind of gave me some basic knowledge. Um, but when I got involved with Woody's records, was when I got a little more involved in the mixing process and uh, what goes on behind the glass and all that stuff. So, uh, and I, I try to once again, I, for the side man in me, try to I try to think about what I would like if I was playing a recording date. And the worst thing in the world is to do a take and hear silence. <laughs> you know, you want you got to hear something from yeah. the, the person. You know, and that really kind of because if there's silence, then everybody's Okay, what do we do? You know, where if you if you just give them an indication, whether something needs to be looked at or the, the director might want to come in and listen to something, just something to kind of make it feel like there's some forward mo momentum there. And obviously, you want to stay positive. But the the hardest thing for me in those sessions is knowing when to say stop. Like mm -hmm. they're in the middle of the take, and something's not quite right. Everybody out there thinks it's fine, but mm -hmm. you know it's. It's really not going to hold up. Like if the leader heard it, he'd say, "No, we can't use that." And you know, guys, chops are going to get tired if you just keep letting them play. So you know, guys, we got to stop. You know, and they're, why? Why do we stop? You know? And then a few times I've had the leader come in and play, play on the thing. And, oh yeah, we couldn't have kept that. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so you want to keep everyone fresh. You want to keep it moving forward. And you don't want to waste time. 
but at the same time you want to be the most productive musically as you can with a group. So that's kind of all the stuff that's going through my mind. On Tony's date, it was, it was a real pleasure. Number one, all you guys were great musicians, but Tony's charts were great and they were yeah, super clear. Uh, he gave me the scores ahead of time, so uh, I, I put markings on them all so I knew when things were happening, little post-it notes and stuff. So I knew when I turned the page, I'd have four bars to tell the engineer to get ready for an entrance by so-and-so or an instrument change or something like that. And, uh, you know, that's really good to, to kind of establish a rapport with, with the engineer as well, mm -hmm. as, as well as the people in, in, on the other side of the glass. And I always strive during the session, and some people don't necessarily work on this so much, but I always strive to get a, a really good live mix during the session because mm -hmm. when the leader comes in to listen, you don't want it to be a distorted view of, of what it is. So I, you know, because I know what a big band sounds like and how everything should level up, you know, I might drive some of the engineers nuts. Can we bring the third trombone up a little <laughs> bit here or bring down the, the second tenor or whatever? But eventually, by the end of the date, it sounds almost sounds like a final product, mm -hmm. which is really helpful because those reference recordings uh, are what the leader bases his mixing process off of. So he's got to know what's there or what's not there so he, he can base... Uh, you know, manage his time, how he's going to mix his big band record. Mm -hmm. Wow, super good points. Another thing, in addition to knowing when to stop, what that I was really impressed with you, and I think as all of us as artists, when we go in to record, we always think we can do a little bit better. You know, keep going, let's do another tape, do a minute. But you yeah. had a very good way of, of yeah, we, we got it. You know, let's go on now. We're, we're good. You know, yeah. and, and that's yeah. that, I mean, you have to have a lot of confidence to make that call and, and know that. The artist is going to be happy, but yeah. it's also a good ability to to uh, to make that call, make that decision. Yeah, because a lot of times the musicians in the room, that you get you get caught up in your own head, and uh, maybe you don't play what you meant to play, but what you did play is pretty hip, <laughs> you know. And, <laughs> right, right. and sometimes it takes a little distance to realize, hey, you know, maybe a few years you put the record on. Oh, I don't remember. I don't know what I was bugged about there. That sounded, that sounded pretty good. Because everybody's train of thought is a little different, but you, there's that little guy in your head that's telling you things when you're playing sometimes, and it, he might be telling you the wrong stuff. Yeah, yeah. And, that's a really good point. I've always found for myself it's, it's, it's usually not as good as I think when I think it's good, and it's also, hope, you know, it's usually not as bad when yeah, I think it's right, bad. Right, so exactly. it's, it's, it's usually in some sort of common ground there. Yeah. Well, John, this has been amazing, and uh, again, thank you for taking time. But as, as we kind of close out, I was wondering if you could bit of a wide question, but um, if you could just kind of talk about your thoughts about the future of the big band and where where you see things going. But, you know, for yourself, I know you're, you know, there's going to be many more John Fedjak projects for sure, but where you see, maybe as an educator, as all the hats that you wear, where you see the long-term future of the big band. Well, as far as the art form goes, uh, it's it's been changing significantly over the past few years. And uh, uh, for many instances for the better. Mm -hmm. um, but the one thing that I have noticed just in the general approach to big bands now is is kind of due to the fact that the world's getting smaller. You know, you're, you're uh, at one time, you know, American, American jazz was one thing and European jazz was another thing and uh, everything was kind of separated. Now you, you kind of feel the American influence more in Europe. Mm -hmm. But in, in the reverse, you're feeling the European influence more in the United States. So, so uh, the element of the jazz tradition, I don't want to say it's disappearing, but it's being masked more with these traditional classical elements or European informed elements in the band. So, uh, and, and you actually have schools of, of uh, composing and arranging that is based upon classical arranging, you know, how to formulate themes and motives and development of themes and things like that. And it used to be that the guys that wrote the charts were the jazz players, you know, Thad Jones and mm -hmm. Bill Holman and, you know, so on. And so all of, everything they wrote was informed by that jazz tradition. Bob Brookmeyer is a great case. Yeah, he, he, sure. he, even as abstract as he got, everything he wrote was still informed by that element of tradition in, in his playing, mm -hmm. the way he composes lines, and in his writing. And, but now you'll have people come starting from that position that without that information. So you, you kind of find, I don't want to say it's being lost, but, but it's, it's being blurred mm -hmm. uh, 
definitely. And some some people that write are never even improvised a solo. Mm -hmm. You know, they just that's they just learned how to to just kind of compose, and uh, so you you'll have you have different kind of streams of what's going on. You've got one element of big band composers who believe that the soloist is an enhancement to the chart, and another element of composers who believe that the soloists are a featured part of the chart, you know, an integral part, not just spice, mm -hmm. but they're an actual thing you focus on. So that's changing quite a bit. So, and then you have influences from, you know, Eastern Europe, you have influences from, from Asia, you have Indian influences, you know, which some of that stuff had happened in the 70s. I mean, I hear of some young big bands and I think, wow, that sounds like Don Ellis in 1974, mm -hmm. you know? But compared, you know, uh, mixed in with all these other items, it does take a di different turn. So I'm not sure where the future will go with that, but as far as educational things, um, it's, the big band is always, in one way or another, going to be a focal point of a jazz program because that's the way to get the most students involved. Mm -hmm. You know, if you base it around a small group, you've got five guys, six guys, seven guys tops. So it's a way to get everyone involved, and it is a way to, to have students learn about playing in an ensemble and playing in tune and blending and all the things you do. If you move to New York and don't become a jazz soloist, if you're playing Broadway or just playing in a section, mm -hmm. uh, you know, crucial, basic musical elements that you, you need in your, in your playing. So I think the big bands will always be there. It's just that the repertoire, is, rep the repertoire is, is changing over the course of time, and it's kind of taking, to my ears, a little bit of a, a split right now. I, I have to say, uh, the one thing I'm proud of, as much as my music has changed over the years since I wrote for Woody's band, is there's still that element of the tradition in there. Not that it's like super you know, like dated kind mm -hmm. of a thing, but, but uh, it's informed by jazz, jazz elements. Uh, my soloing as a, you know, post bop player, whatever you want to call it, um, is, it, it's all in there. The harmonies I use, things like that. It's, it's, even as far as I stretch it, that's, that's something that stays within there. So I just think it's kind of going like tentacles now, and it's not just this one stream anymore. Mm -hmm. Wow, really well said. So much... Uh Great information, and I think uh, just to echo your thoughts about the big band. I mean, that's when I look back on it. That's where I learned how to play in the ensemble. So there's so much to be gained from it. So sure. you're, you're absolutely right, and it's always going to be a focal point uh, in, in some capacity. John, thank you so much. Thank it's you, been Mike. Awesome. Uh, it's uh, I knew it was going to be inspiring, and uh, and it, as as always, you never disappoint. It was great, <laughs> and uh, and uh, everybody, make sure to check out the new CD coming out in August. Like yeah. it is. Like it is. Like it is for John Fedchuk, New York big band. And thanks again, John. We really yeah, appreciate Mike. your time today. And we will see all of you next time on Bone to Pick.